Now, the task of dealing with sets of meanings in schools has traditionally fallen upon people like us, the curriculum specialists, etc. Historically, however, this concern for meanings in schools by curriculus has been linked to varied notions of social control. This shouldn't surprise us. It should be obvious, though it is not usually so, that questions about meanings in social institutions tend to become questions of control. That is, the forms of knowledge one finds within school settings, both overt and covert kinds of knowledge, imply relations of power and economic resources and control. The very choice of school knowledge, the act of designing school environments, though it may never be done consciously, often is based on ideological and economic presuppositions that provide the common sense rules for educators' thought and action. Now, perhaps the linkages between meaning and control in schools can be made clearer if I turn now to a relatively abbreviated account of curricular history. The British sociologist Bill Williamson argues that men and women have to contend with the institutional and ideological forms of earlier times as the basic constraints on what they can achieve. Now, if one takes this notion seriously in looking at education, what is both provided and taught in schools must be understood historically. As he notes, I quote, earlier educational attitudes of dominant groups in society still carry historical weight and are exemplified even in the bricks and mortar of the school buildings themselves. If we are to be honest with ourselves, the curriculum field itself has its roots in the soil of social control. From its very beginnings in the early part of this century, when its intellectual paradigm took shape and became an identifiable set of procedures uh, for selecting and organizing knowledge for schools, a set that was taught to teachers and other educators, the fundamental consideration of the formative members of the curriculum field was in fact social control. Part of this concern for social control is understandable. Many historically important figures who influenced the curriculum field, C.C. Peters, Ross Finney, especially David Sneddon, had interests that spanned both the field of educational sociology and the more general problem of what should concretely happen in schools. Given the growing importance of the idea of social control in the American sociological society at the time, an idea which seemed to capture both the imagination and energy of so many of the nation's intelligentsia, as well as powerful segments of the business community, it is not difficult to see how it captured also those figures who wore two hats, who were both sociologists and curriculum workers as well. But an interest for, in schooling as a mechanism for social control was not merely borrowed from sociology. The individuals who first called themselves curriculum workers, men like Franklin Bobbitt, W.W. Charters, were vitally concerned with social control for ideological reasons as well. Influenced strongly by the scientific management movement and the work of social measurement specialists like Thorndike, and guided by beliefs that found, say, the popular eugenics movement in quotes, a progressive social force, these men brought social control into the very heart of the field whose task it was to develop criteria for selecting those meanings students would come into contact with in our educational institutions. Now, this is not to say that social control in and of itself is always negative, of course. In fact, it is nearly impossible to envision social life without some element of control, if only due to the fact that institutions qua institutions tend to respond to the regularities of human interaction. Rather, and this becomes critical, I think, there was a historically specific set of assumptions of common sense rules about social meanings and control that strongly influenced early curriculum workers. It incorporated not merely the idea that organized society must maintain itself through the preservation of some of its valued forms of interaction and meaning, a quite general and wholly understandable weak sense of social control, but also deeply embedded in their ideological perspective was what might be called a strong sense of control. Here education in general and the everyday meanings of the curriculum in schools in particular were seen as essential elements in the preservation of existing social privilege, interest, and knowledge of one element of the population at the expense of less powerful groups. Most often this took the form of attempting to guarantee expert and scientific control in society to eliminate or, in quotes, socialize unwant unwanted racial or ethnic groups or characteristics or to produce an economically efficient group of citizens in order to, at least as C.C. Peters put it, uh, reduce the maladjustment of workers from their jobs. It is this latter interest, the economic substratum of everyday school life, that will become of particular importance when I look at, at what schools actually teach about, say, work and play in a later section of this presentation. <clears throat> 